Hello, this is the Idea to Startup podcast brought to you by Tacklebox, the accelerator for founders with full-time jobs. Recently, a founder told me that Tacklebox was like a personal trainer who has a regimen that kicks the crap out of your idea until you see clearly whether your idea has potential or not. I'm weirdly fine with that. Anyway, today on the podcast, we're talking with Kim Kaup, the founder of Superfan. Kim's built a great business the past eight years on the back of one core insight. There's a small percentage of fans that want a lot more than what they're getting from their favorite musician, baseball team, music festival, just about anything they care about. Her clients include Carrie Underwood, the Boston Red Sox, the Stagecoach Music Festival, and Paul McCartney. And she's built experiences to delight these diverse fan bases. Best of all, she's done it with exactly zero dollars in funding. Kim's also built a powerful personal brand something we get into as an important question I get from a lot of founders is should they elevate themselves when building their product? Do they matter? Will them being the face of their business hurt or help? Finally, we talk about the tough decision of going B2B or B2C. This is a good one. I hope you enjoy. Here's Kim and have a great 4th of July weekend. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And for anyone who doesn't know, what is Superfan? Uh, The Superfan agency focuses on fans and obviously really rapid fan bases that cannot get enough of their favorite music artists, sports team, celebrity movie, that sort of thing. So we focus on that subset of fans and making sure they are surprised and delighted and feel really connected to the things they love. Awesome. I am really excited to have you on because this sounds like a ridiculously daunting idea to start. <laughs> so I'd love to hear Any how. Any idea is a daunting <laughs> idea to start, but yes. That's very true. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear how this started. Like, What was the idea that kicked this all off? Absolutely. So my co-founder, Brittany, and I really were seeing in the space eight years ago when we started the company. I always like to tell people, you know, January 2011, if I could paint a picture, there was no Spotify, there was no Instagram, there was no Snapchat, Twitter was just becoming this weird thing that that people were starting to use. So the landscape of how we consumed entertainment was completely different than what it is today. But what we were seeing is, okay, Facebook was starting to permeate beyond young people. And and what we're seeing is that these celebrities and entertainers that were on the platform, it used to be really fine for some of them to post once a month. And then it turned into once a week. And then it turned into once a day. And then it turned into once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And what we're seeing is like, wow, they keep kind of feeding the bears. Like they're feeding the bears more and more and more, which that just means the bears are going to keep coming if you keep feeding them. And not only that, if you stop feeding them, they're getting really angry, which is pretty much what's happened now, fast forward eight years, when any celebrity like Selena Gomez decides to take a break from Instagram, the fan base goes apoplectic (laughs) because they are so used to being fed information. What it also caused is we're seeing that people were becoming less, less disconnected from their favorite celebrities and sports teams and entertainers and if anything were becoming more connected because it wasn't just oh I like Justin Bieber's songs it was what is he eating for breakfast what is his workout plan who's doing his hair how is he styling his clothes and people became more connected to these other parts of an artist or an actor or a sports team that we were never able to see before um certainly when I was growing up we were never able to see it so we decided to start this company to really focus on that subset, those super fans who are going to lean really, really far in and get really, really excited by these opportunities to engage further. Awesome. I love a tight customer segment, so I like that a lot. Um, yes, it's super, <laughs> super niche. I always tell people, they're like, well, who is a super fan? And there are super fans everywhere. Super fandom is not a demographic, it's a psychographic. And it doesn't matter if you're young or you're old or where you live. And when I have people say, oh, well, I'm not a super fan of anything, I always say, well, what coffee did you drink this morning? What airline did you fly? What shoes do you swear by? Because people will sit there and talk all day long about you have to fly Delta. 
you know, I don't buy anything but Delta, or I only drink Starbucks coffee, you can't drink anything else but Starbucks coffee, or my mom's spaghetti is the best spaghetti, and every other spaghetti is terrible. It's like, you are a super fan of whatever that thing is that you will live and die by. So everyone is a super fan of something. My mom's spaghetti is the best. <laughs> it um, could be that. So, so that's really interesting to me, and I, I love that. I think that, in general, founders should go after that to start. So, mm -hmm. yeah. like, rewinding back to when you started, was there a specific artist that you were like, this artist has crazy, like, crazy yeah. artists? <laughs> when I started the company at 25, I was just like, can someone give us work? <laughs> like, like, anyone? Like, I don't even care who it is. Um, and I think just in that beginning, you're, you just want someone to believe. And I think what we ended up doing a really great job of is, in the beginning, people are shocked, but we pretty much worked for free because I knew that once we had a case study, once we had something that I could go to people and say, here, Brian, I know it has Ralph on here, but imagine it with you. But we needed that first piece to be able to take to all those other meetings. So the first couple projects, we were pretty much like, listen, we'll do this for free. Like, it, no harm, no foul on your part. You get something out of it. We get something out of it. Great. So the first couple projects we did for pretty much zero dollars in order to have something to go and show other people. Because I think there is a real domino effect. And you see that in a lot of startups, whether you're talking about press, whether you're talking about product. Um, I'll have friends who have a product business, and the minute they get in Whole Foods, everything blows up. Because anybody else they go to, they can be like, well, Whole Foods carries us. And it's the same thing with press. The minute you get like one piece of good press, it's a waterfall system into everything else. Because once you can say, well, I was on the New York Times top 50 entrepreneurs of the decade, then it's much easier to go to Forbes, an entrepreneur, when you have something to point to behind you and say, well, if they said something was good, then it must be good. And that's true whether you're a product or a service and whether you're talking about your own business or a PR or stunt. So early on, if founders or anybody can borrow some credibility from somewhere else. Yes. Not only really borrow credibility, but get it wherever you can. If so many entrepreneurs come to me and say, like, Kim, you're on the Forbes under 30 list. Like, how do I get on Forbes? And I'm always like, hold on, boo. <laughs> Don't worry about getting on Forbes. What's local? Is there is there a local award in Greenwich, Connecticut? I don't know. Is there something that you can win there? And can you go from that and get something from the state of Connecticut? And from the state of Connecticut and, and build. And that way, when you finally apply to a Forbes or you finally go to someone, again, you have something to point behind you and say, look, I was number one alumni from my college, or I won this award, or I won that award. And it's much easier for people to say yes when they see that it's been previously verified. And that is true anywhere, down to date. You can go on a date with someone and think that you had a great time, but the minute one of your friends says, oh my gosh, I went to college with him, he's great, you're kind of saying, oh, I'm definitely going to go on a second date. You know, because you have that validation from another source. And PR is the same way. So I always tell people, get validation from other sources before you go after some of these bigger fish. Because it makes it much, much easier than just nothing and out of the blue. Yeah, that's great. So I'm interested in, in taking like a little step back and saying, all right, so you get these clients for free. Yeah. What was that first product in like? <laughs> How I don't want to like suggest that it was stressful, but I imagine the yeah. first product like that might be. Oh my gosh, our first project was for the brand Kids Bob, which if you don't know Kids Bob, it is essentially a brand that gets kids to sing popular songs, but they clean up all the lyrics. So what's ever in the top ten right now, Ariana Grande or whatever, they will take out all the curse words. They'll maybe change around the phrases. So instead of saying we're all up in the club, it'll say, we're all up in the clubhouse, <laughs> you know, and instead of sipping on scissor, it'll be like sipping on apple juice. Like they change all the words to make it kid friendly. Um, but that was our first project and it was definitely really nerve wracking because it was the first real product that we had in market and no one knows. You can have all these hypotheses and I think it's going to do well and you know, statistically it should do well, but 
you never know. I mean, once you put it out there, you're just kind of sitting back and crossing your fingers. So it was extremely stressful, but it's also something that I think that the blissful, naive 25 year old me that was doing it was very much a sort of shrug your shoulders and yeah, we'll see if this works. You know, there wasn't, I didn't have a second mortgage on my house and I wasn't, oh my God, I have to put my kids through college or, oh my gosh, my husband's going to kill me if this didn't work. You know, I had no kids, no husband. Thankfully, because I had scholarships, no college debt. You know, I didn't have some of these looming things over me that I think some entrepreneurs is a real fear and a real problem. Um, So for me, it was like, okay, we're going to see if this works and it's stressful. But I think looking back, I definitely didn't have the type of stress that I would have now if I were to do it all over again. Sure. And just, I was naive and it was my first company and I didn't know. If you would have asked me what are the odds that this is going to make it, I would have said 50-50. I mean, now I've read enough studies that the odds of making it as an entrepreneur are like 2% or 3 it's like 90% of startups fail or, I mean, you probably know it's some ridiculous number, but at the time I was so unaware. I was just like, yeah, we have a real shot at this. And I look back now and I'm like, oh, I'm so dumb. <laughs> so young and dumb in the best way. Yeah, but like, but some things definitely worked. Like, because you got going, and so I think about that. So you get your first client, and then you start. I imagine that's pretty manual. And you start rolling into your product, and you start thinking about like, who's our next client? How do we start growing? Totally. So what was like the mindset around growth? And did you have a, a full time job at the time? Yeah. So I had a full time job. Dep- started as a side hustle, and then when it got to be too much on nights and weekends, quit. Cool. So my co-founder and I quit our jobs and did it full time, but it was a real struggle. I mean, as it is for everybody in the beginning, but I always tell people as long as you can hold hold on your job, like start something on the side and start it. I always joke on somebody else's paycheck, because if you can iterate on nights and weekends and change things and whatever, it's certainly better to iterate with a paycheck and health insurance and 401k than to be iterating on zero dollars and zero healthcare, and that's a really scary fact. So if you can iterate on nights and weekends, it's like, that's always my preferred method. Although some people are balls to the wall, they want to quit their jobs and go for it. But I think having that financial stability is, I'm also very, I I joke I'm kind of risk averse, which everyone doesn't believe because obviously starting my own company and whatnot, but I do think that it's about balancing risk and I definitely believe in risk, but I believe in taking risks when you thought of plan B, C, and D and not just kind of gone plan A and not thought about anything else. But I think in the beginning, starting knowing that there were some safety nets that we had built in and then also just knowing that it was going to be okay if it didn't work, you know, that, that I wasn't, I was going to lose time and effort and money and reputation, but I wasn't going to lose my home or, you know, my kids weren't going to be or something like that. Um, but after that first project came out, I think, again, going back to my earlier point of getting that early validation and rolling with it, having something to point to was really, really helpful. And then also empowering those that we worked with to advocate on behalf of us. Because I also believe that even after eight years, the best marketing that my company can do is through our clients. We've won a ton of awards. We've been featured in a ton of things. Nothing is more powerful than a client saying to someone else, you have to work with them. They are phenomenal. Like no amount of press is going to be that one-to-one recommendation. So I think with those early, early projects, telling those people, Hey, we loved working with you. Hopefully you loved working with us. If you don't mind, can you introduce us to three people in your Rolodex that you think would also like working with us? And luckily those early, early, early believers were like, sure, here's my Rolodex. Here's, here's people that I can introduce you to. And coming through someone that you've worked with and can vouch for you is, is huge. And that's really how we started to grow in that first year was through those referrals. Is there something that you did early on? So I like to think about startups as like, 
I think a lot of people think that you can do ordinary stuff and kind of get extraordinary results. Yeah. I just don't think that's really how it works. I think that about the gym. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I can go to the gym twice a week and <laughs> like Giselle, and that's not the case, <laughs> sadly. Um, so thinking about like what an ordinary person would do approaching a startup like this, and then thinking about how you approach it, like what are, what are some of the things that you would consider um, I don't want to like put you on the spot, but what did you do that was extraordinary? Yeah, like, yeah. What were the things that created like a delta for you that really, really worked? Yeah. I, the things that I think were extraordinary when we first started gave up a lot personal wise in terms of, you know, missing family vacations. Uh, that was huge. Missing birthday parties, uh, having friends get really mad and because you weren't making it to things that were important to them. And, you know, maybe TMI, but I definitely lost some romantic relationships in the beginning that were, I have since called those people and apologized, but but it was totally my fault, um, admittedly, because I didn't have the bandwidth to give to everyone. And, and I still say that all the time. I say, I have 100% and it's like a pie chart. And everybody's on there but where their percentage is is like constantly changing there are some days where i'm a super awesome badass boss and a really shitty girlfriend and kind of an awful daughter and then there are times where i'm an awesome daughter and maybe not so great of a boss so like the pie is always shifting and changing but i think in that first year it was 90 percent this business and 10 percent Friends, family, romantic partners, uh, you know, life, care. I like gain weight. Um, you know, self care was just out the window, eating really poorly, not exercising. Because again, you're just eat, sleep, breathe, work, 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 work. And that I think is a big delta that people say they want a business, but they don't want to do the work. You know, I say that I want a uh, body like a Victoria's Secret model, but like, quite frankly, I'm not willing to do the work. I'm not willing to go to the gym twice a day, five days a week. I'm not willing to eat nothing but veggies and chicken because that's boring. But like, if you ask those girls, that's what they have to do. And I always say to people, you can get anywhere, but it's what are you willing to give up? And a lot of people aren't willing to give up. It's not right or wrong. They just, like me, I don't want to go to the gym twice a day. Like, they just choose not to do what it might take to have their business become extraordinary. And sometimes to your point, like things are just also could just be a bad idea. Like people could be working really, really hard on an idea and it's just, it's not good. And it, it doesn't matter how much work you put into it, people don't want the product or don't need the service or the, the technology's not super awesome. So I feel like it's, I feel like finding that it's not the necessarily the only thing, but at least for my personal belief in why we were so successful in the beginning, I think it was dedicating just exorbitant amounts of energy to the business. Was there anything you did specifically as part of that energy that gave you like a larger return than the time you invested? A way larger return than the time you invested. I think I'm going to go back to it. I think really talking to those early clients and asking them to open doors for us. I think, especially as women, we get really shy to ask for things or, oh, I shouldn't ask, and oh, he's gonna think that I'm being pushy or whatever. But what I've realized in the course of eight years of starting the company is people that you work with that have a good experience usually genuinely want to help you. Like genuinely when they end a meeting and say, if there's anything I can do for you, you know, let me know. I always tell people, speak up. Don't just say, oh, okay, good to know, thanks. Say, well, now that you mentioned it, actually, can you help me do these three things? Can you introduce me to this person? Can you write a review for my LinkedIn? Can you, you know, whatever, whatever it is, ask. And I think that that is the most powerful thing that takes very little time, but can play off in spades, spades for you and bring amazing opportunities would never have had if you didn't ask, if you didn't just ask. That's a really good one. And you mentioned it, uh, we, we've had at Tacklebox, we for like 65% female founders. And I, I do think it is sometimes easier for men or more natural for men to ask for stuff, whereas the 
potentially totally. I mean, that would be much more you being able to comment on that than me. Um, but I think it's really good advice for everyone. Definitely. And I think it's also as women, we tend to try to be this sort of Superman. And that's what's been portrayed in the media in terms of we can, don't get me started on Lena, and I never want to hear about leaving it again in terms of we can take care of the kids and clean the house and have a Pinterest worthy kitchen and work, you know, like the most crazy CEO there is. And, and you're, you're trying to do everything instead of waving the little white flag and saying, I can't do all this. It's not physically possible. So how can I get a clean lady? Can I get a virtual assistant? Can I get, you know, I think asking for help is it's almost shameful because in the media it's like, well, you should be doing everything like this sort of leave it to be for style version of, of how women should be leaning in. And it's just, it's not realistic. The Pinterest pages aren't realistic. The perfectly curated Instagrams aren't realistic. And so the one thing that I always tell women entrepreneur, entrepreneurial or not is to ask for help, ask for help from people around you, from your friends, from your loved ones, because a lot of times, they want to help and they have no idea how. They have no idea how to help you. My mom always ends calls by saying, I wish I could help, but you know, I, I can't negotiate this deal for you. And there are times when she's right, but there are times when I say, Mom, I have to plan a trip next week and just I have no bandwidth. Can you look up flights for me? It's so simple, but it is such a big help, and it makes her feel like she's able to help me too. So I think just that ask is is really important. Cool. We've had a bunch of founders say something similar. I'm, I'm blanking on which one it was, but we did an interview recently where someone said the biggest delta between what they did and other people did is they basically exported all their Gmail contacts when they were starting the company. Yeah. So they had a list of like 3,500 people. And then they bucketed them, bucketed them into close friends, acquaintances, and yeah. like broader men. Ah, okay. And they wrote three specific types of emails with a different ask for each. There you go. Like share this to the top, to the closer ones, like take a look at this to the not close ones, and drove like a ton of traffic early on. Hundred percent. But it's taking the time. I mean, I can't even imagine. That must be very time consuming <laughs> to organize thirty five hundred people. Yep. Holy cow. Um, That's a lot. Yeah. So, um, so I think something interesting to touch on. So you start going with this business, and it is like a true marketplace where you've got the content creators on one side and you've got all of your like end user customers on the other. Yeah. Um, how did you balance acquiring and like building a product for both sides? Of I honestly don't think we did a great job at it. self admittedly I think, I think early on we had an identity crisis of trying to be a B2C company and a B2B company. And it took us a good four or five years to really say, we're not a B2C company. We're just not. They're not the people that are paying our bills. They're not the people that are, you know, driving this business. So when I think of a B2C company, I think of, okay, I sell socks. You know, I have a deal with Walmart, Kmart, Amazon to sell my socks. I know that the socks cost $2. They sell them for $4. I get my $2. Okay, great. The way our business worked is we would create a product for, let's say, in those early years, a record label. The record label would own the product. The record label would sell it to Walmart, Amazon, Target, etc. So what was happening is we might sell the product to the record label for $5. They were selling it to Walmart for $7. And Walmart was selling it to the end consumer for $11. So we actually got no part of the sale. So it wasn't like, oh, the more they sell, the more we get. Once we sold it to the record label, we were done. So the amount of consumer engagement or the amount of like, it actually didn't affect our bottom line. And I think in those early years, we, um, if you've ever seen Mean Girls, we kept trying to make fetch happen. <laughs> fetch was not happening. Uh, we kept trying to force like, well, we need consumers to recognize our brand name and we need consumers to recognize this product and we need consumers. And at the end it was like, but the consumers aren't paying us. They just weren't. That, that wasn't the model we had set up. And so I think it took a couple of years, but finally it was saying, you know, we're really a baby business. We need to focus less on the consumers and we need to focus more on 
the, in that case, the record labels who are paying our bills. Um, and I think if we had figured that out sooner, I, I would have loved to have seen where our company could have gone or, or what could have happened, but hindsight is 2020. And it was a really good learning lesson. So glad we went through it. I think a lot of founders go through that. If there's, if I put the previous business that I started, we had a similar like B2B to C model. Mm -hmm. And it just seems more fun getting like an end user. Yeah, totally. And it's just like, it's a weird version of lost version where it's like, if I stop selling to them, then I lose my contact with the customer, then I'm just a B2B company. Yeah, yeah. But B2B is not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to start a B2B company. Everybody's like, I want millions of people to <laughs> love my product and like, I want to connect millions of people. And yeah, it's not really not B2B <laughs> usually. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's any dream of an entrepreneur to be saying to themselves, I'm going to create a business that nobody ever knows of or hears of or really has any clue about, you know. So I think a lot of that's ego, too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's, that's awesome that you made that switch. On that, I'll ask one more sort of tough question. Um, what were, so you said that was, I don't know if you call that a mistake or just a learning point, but right. um, what other, were there any sort of big mistakes that you made early? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> so many mistakes. Still make mistakes, by the way. I think it's so funny when people are like, you made it. And I was like, I don't want to tell you what I did last week. <laughs> um, but no, we had tons, tons of mistakes. I think one of my favorite, I mean, it's not favorite, but it's funny. Now it's funny. At the time, it was not funny. Um, when we first started the company, you're in that sort of hustle, crush it, cheap, thrifty, you know, do what you can to get what you can. And we decided, okay, you know, we're not going to pay for a bookkeeper. Bookkeepers are expensive. We don't need them. We can just watch hundreds of hours of YouTube. <laughs> oh my God, don't do this. Um, and we can, and we can do this. Again, in hindsight, people spend years learning how to be an accountant and, and decades learning about tax laws and the intricacies of tax law. But we thought we could YouTube it, which <laughs> newsflash, you cannot. And so we thought we're going to do our own books in the first year and no problem. We got this. We understand taxes. Um, and I'll never forget that second year. I go down and get my mail and there's a letter from the IRS. <laughs> and I was like, that's funny. Why is the IRS contacting me? And I open the letter and they basically say, you know, you're an idiot <laughs> and you haven't paid city taxes the entire year. And honest to God, I had to Google what is a city tax. I had, I grew up in Florida. I knew we had federal taxes and I knew we had state taxes. I had zero idea about city taxes at all because I had worked in corporate and in corporate the taxes just, I don't know, they magically come out of your paycheck and whatever is in your bank account is what you get to spend. And so I had no concept of city taxes, which we basically had not paid the entire year. And not only did we need to pay those, we had fines because we hadn't been paying them on time. And that's when I was kind of like, ding, ding, ding. We need an accountant. Like, we need a bookkeeper. And thankfully, we found one who specialized in small businesses. And God love him. He spent six months cleaning up our books. By the way, that was the tip of the iceberg. We had done so many things incorrectly and i think it was it was a costly mistake i mean the fines and also a cost of time which as you know in those beginning months and years your time is what is so valuable so to waste so much of it not only learning faulty things on youtube but fixing it and contacting IRS and saying whoops and trying and sorting through all that it was a huge huge time suck and time you can never get back the money you certainly never got back uh and it was a massive massive mistake early on but yeah i have uh, i unfortunately have about 50 of those stories but that is one of my one of my favorites that we thought we could get what people spend four years getting an education at college for in a few hours it's that emoji like <laughs> face, face palm uh, so Thinking back to that sort of like the early phase, you sort of grow a little bit. I found that like usually within that first year, so things are really exciting early yeah. on. You get a customer, yeah. And there's like a wall. Yeah. Um, 
did you experience that well? And were there like times you were thinking about quitting or was it always you like... You mean yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> you mean yesterday when I felt like saying, screw all of this, I'm out. So what, so what kept you going early on if there, like if there was a little yeah. that was pretty bad, what was the, was there like faith in customer or product or... I'm trying to think, because we weren't a B2C business, we never really had a lull in customer because that wasn't really where we were getting our money from. But I think we've also iterated the business so much, as you can imagine being in the marketing and entertainment and fan space over eight years. I, I joke that it feels like every year we're pivoting our company, not massive pivots, but these little tiny pivots, because every time, you know, again, I keep harping on it, but all of a sudden you have Instagram. Okay, that brings a new pivot. Okay, suddenly Snapchat debuts. Okay, that's a new pivot. Okay, now we have TikTok. Okay, now we have more music festivals than we've ever seen in a 20-year period. The landscape is constantly changing, so you're constantly having to iterate based on the technology, based on consumer engagement based on just fads. You know, I think anyone could argue that live entertainment has gone up exponentially. You also have these very Instagram worthy live entertainment experiences like Color Factory, Museum of Ice Cream, Rose Mansion, uh, Saved by the Bell, you know, where they recreated the, the Max. There are so many that, that did in LA for a couple months. So you have all, they did a Seinfeld pop up here in New York a couple of years ago where they recreated groups from Seinfeld. You just, the live entertainment space is, is definitely growing in a way that, again, I can never remember it a decade ago ever being something that people wanted to see and go and experience. So I feel that our business is always kind of in this state of micro pivots as opposed to macro pivots. And I tell people all the time, I think pivot can be a scary word because they think they have to completely change their business. So I can't pivot because I've spent so much time working on this. And I always say, think of it as micro pivots, sort of adjusting almost as if you're hanging a picture on a wall. You know, I'm not telling you to turn the picture. I'm saying, you know, just keep adjusting it, you know, keep taking steps back and, and constantly adjusting it. Because I think that is when you perfect the business, when you never stop tweaking it. I actually think the minute you stop tweaking it, your business is dead. Because tech changes too fast, the, the landscape changes too fast, that if you're not constantly tweaking, you're dead in the water. Now, it, it happened with TV, happened with record labels, you know, their platforms have had to really shift. And had they been pivoting all along, I don't think it would have gotten to where it did. Is there a framework or a process that you use to identify which trends are worth investing time and money in? Or do you sort of like, is it fine to be like a lagging, a little bit of a lagging indicator trying to jump ahead of them? I think because we're a bootstrapped company, I never want to be an early adopter. Tried that, didn't work, lost a lot of money. When you have VC money or you have funding, yeah, like go be an early adopter because if you have a $2 million oops, it's not going to kill your business because you've raised a series B and you have tons of money in the bank. Great. When you're bootstrapped, you don't have the free-for-all to lose in that early adoption age. And if you're bootstrapped, you have to sort of lag behind because you have to let people go and see what happens first. And if you start to see that it's working, then you can sort of follow in their tailwind. Um, and I think that that's just a matter of financing and a matter of what you're willing to take risk on. But I think for me personally, it's always been about seeing where the trends are going, but not being the first one there. It's just not how our business is set up. I love that you brought up fundraising. <laughs> uh, so I, you never raised money. Right. Did you consider it? Um, was it something you tried to do and couldn't raise, or was it a conscious decision? No, I never raised. Never thought about raising. It seems really hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have lots of other fellow founder friends who have done it. It seems very stressful, all the decks and the meetings, and it, it seems like a lot of work. So, um, big kudos. But I 
really think that for the type of business that we run, the agency model of just knowing what things cost and marking them up, I think it's different if you had a tech platform, if you were trying to start a SaaS business, if you were trying to do something where you couldn't immediately make money because you had to invest so much from the start. I think for us, you know, I always say we didn't start a cupcake shop where you had to buy the physical space, buy the cupcake mixers, buy all the ingredients before you could even open the doors to see that money come in or build the technology of an Uber where you had to build all the, the platforms and the engineers and the learning. You know, we just had our brains and our computer and ideas and monetizing ideas doesn't cost anything because ideas, you know, you don't have to pay it's me, it's my brain. So I mean, you don't have to pay for my brain. Well, you do if you're a client, but I didn't have to. And so I think for for raising, it wasn't something that was necessary. And so it was really just this thought process of, well, if we don't need it, why are we going to do it? Because I think that fundraising has become sexy and cool, and people think that it's really fun. But I always go back to the basics of, do you actually need it? Forget having the fancy offices, forget being able to say that you're sitting at the cool kids table. Do you actually need the money? Because with that money, you give up a lot. Give up control, board seats, percentages, equity. You know, and I always say, unless you need to do it, don't do it. There's no reason to go through it. It's funny you mentioned that it seems really hard because most of the founders that I meet with would think what you did is harder than just raising money Think that, that will open the door to just like sort of jump over there. Yeah. But I don't think they're thinking of the personal stress and toll. And I, and I use this example all the time. If I go to Vegas and gamble, and I gamble with my hundred dollars and I lose it, I kind of say, okay, that seems for me. If I go with a group of friends to a bachelorette party and I plan the whole thing and I end up picking a terrible hotel, the restaurant was awful, I feel terrible because people have spent their hard-earned money on what was supposed to be a fun, exciting time and I ruined it for them. Like the bachelorette party analogy is terrible. And then I feel bad and I tell people all the time, that's raising money. You are taking money from people that, if it's a friends and family round that you know, and there's a chance that you can completely squander it, like the whole thing. And now you have to be with all those people and say, all that money you gave, hoping this is gonna be great, I'm positive, whatever, and you just went, <clears throat> that takes a toll on you. And if it doesn't, you're a sociopath <laughs> because that means you don't have feelings and you're a robot. Um, you know, having that responsibility of I have other people's money invested in me. And it's not just about, oh, my own money. Well, if I screw up my own thing, that's fine. If I screw up this thing for all of these other people, I think that responsibility lives with you all the time. All the, I, I tell people now I have employees. I've never gotten a restful night's sleep in eight years because you constantly have this little ball in your stomach that is just constantly worried, constantly worried about, you know, for me, I'm constantly looking at Trump with these China tariffs because we deal with China sometimes and what's going to go on and how is that going to affect and the payroll and you're, you're constantly having that. But I also think that that's what makes a great entrepreneur is you're constantly thinking about threats and opportunities and whatever. Whereas I think if you think that taking other people's money is going to make that disappear, or, or solve that, I actually think if anything, it makes it worse. Because I do have friends that have raised significant rounds of money, and they tell me all the time that they feel pressure. And it might not be those people pressuring them, it's your own self-pressure of feeling like you're letting all these people down or losing people money. I mean, that's not a good feeling. I've done it. <laughs> I've done it, it's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> Um, it's interesting. You think that people really think that, that bootstrapping is, is more stressful? 100%. Really? <laughs> Why? Because they haven't done it? Or because they just think, oh, by other people's money, it's more fun and it's not mine? Yeah, I think there's this myth that, like, well, if you're, like, VCs lose money all the time, or whoever, angel investors lose money all the time, or if they wouldn't invest it, they couldn't lose it, and then right. they'll just magically be fine. 
losing that money. Um, Interesting. I bet it, it, you are not right. It's awful. You're like, not awful. Everything you say is true. I still think about it. I have investors from an earlier company that I started on the cap table at Tacklebox. Yeah. They have not invested. I just felt so bad that I lost right. that I put them on the cap table. You just feel awful. <laughs> if you don't feel awful, like you're a weird person. <laughs> you know? Um, so you brought up something interesting that I want to talk about. So you've got, you're running this company, you've got employees, you've got tariffs, like things like you've got yeah, all these extra yeah. employees, you've got your existing clients, you've got the relationships in the company you have to manage. Yeah. How do you handle that? How do you prioritize? <laughs> Not well. <laughs> no. Um, how do I prioritize? I think it goes back to, again, that pie chart. I, I just have accepted the fact that I'm not going to be an A-plus player every single day in all of those different facets because it's just it's just too much. And it's about showing up the best I can and also trying to even it out. I think it's also hard because I have a client-based business. And this is true, I'm sure, since the beginning of time that people with straight hair want curly hair, people with curly hair want straight hair. And Founders that have service businesses want products, and founders that have products want services. Um, because I look at you know my friends with products, and I go, oh, you know the peanut butter doesn't talk back. <laughs> you know the peanut butter has no thoughts. I want a peanut butter business. Um, and then you know because I'm dealing with humans, I'm dealing with clients who you know wake up one day and decide they want purple instead of blue, and I want to do this instead of that, or the dates are changing or this is flowing and that takes a certain amount of mental energy and space to deal with humans instead of peanut butter. Um, but I think that it's just trying to balance it the best I can. But yeah, I mean, there are days where I go home and I just want silence, like no podcast, no TV, I just want to make my dinner and just sit alone in silence, which sounds so dark and scary, but it's just because you're talked out or you're just peopled out. It's just exhausting. Um, and so I think just finding the time to, to try to do all those things well is sort of how I mentally accepted it because I know that it's not going to be great every day, unfortunately. Yeah, that, that kind of... Because I see my next question. So, like, one of the things that I admire a lot about you, I've admired for a while, is you are everywhere. Like, I, you, you're just a hustler. Like, I can yeah. tell that you've done an incredible job building a business and building a personal brand. And they sort of like go hand in hand really nicely. So, like, opportunities like Shark Tank or opportunities uh, like the LinkedIn series that you run, it doesn't surprise me that you're exhausted at the end of the day. Um, so, thinking about how you approach those sorts of opportunities? Like, how do you do such a good job of, like, personal branding and having to feed into their marketing? Yeah, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot, actually, and I think how I've tried to mentally wrap my head around it is, I think sometimes when people hear personal branding and hustling and being everywhere, they think about it as work, whereas I try to think about it as fun. Instagram stories, I think, are hilarious. I, Put a bunch of emojis all over them, and I think it's really fun. And the LinkedIn stuff, I think, has been really fun. And I try to think of it as fun and extra, whereas I think so much of it now has turned into well, it's influencer and it's a space and it's a business, and how are you monetizing and what's your content schedule? And I'm like, forget all that, forget the money, forget the content, have fun. And I think that a lot of times people actually respond to that. I get so many messages from people saying, wow, it actually looks like you're having fun at work today. And I'm, I am, I actually am having fun at work today. And I think people say, oh wow, you know that LinkedIn thing of you on the street talking, it looks so natural. And it was because I came out of a meeting and I did do that. And so I think that sometimes what has happened with Instagram or with these social platforms is people want to curate everything and everything is perfectly curated that they miss that authenticity and that spark and that fun because they made it a business. And I think it's really hard to make fun of business. I think it's possible, but I think for me it's hard. So I, the attitude that I've taken with everything is just to not forget the fun and to have a lot of joy in what you're doing. Because I think that, you know, it sounds really hippy dippy for me to say, have joy. Um, but I think that people feel that. 
And I think it's something that people can't put their finger on because I've had people say, watch your videos. And it's not that you're telling me anything I don't know, but there's something about the way that you're saying it, or it's something about the way that it hit me that it just resonated more. And I think it's that joy. I think that it's coming through and saying, you know, I want to help people. I want to share this story in a way that doesn't feel contrived and doesn't feel super curated. That's great. It, it's very juxtaposed from a lot of founders that I've met who think of it as, as a total job. Total like, job, yeah. You need to do, and then they dread it. And if you dread mm -hmm. it, and you, so you can dread writing an email and still write a good email, but right. I doubt you can dread a good Instagram, like have a good Instagram story if you don't actually want to be there doing it. No, and I think people can tell. I think people can tell. I, th I think friends and family and consumer, I mean, they're smart. Yep. They're not idiots. So if they see that you're sort of phoning it in and doing an Instagram story or doing this, these posts on Twitter or whatever it is, I mean, I, I see it. I'm not going to name names, but I see founders that are, I know 100% doing it because some social media manager is telling them to do it. And I think my biggest point is if you don't like social media and you are a founder, here's a revolutionary thought. Don't do it. I think that somewhere along the line, somebody put out this message that, well, you got to do it. You got to have a presence. You got to be talking. You got to be out there. No, you don't. You actually don't. You know, Warren Buffett's not doing Instagram stories. He's done just fine. You know, I think that there's this pressure that everyone has to be doing it. And if that's not your personality type or you're an introvert or you just don't like putting yourself out there or you don't want your face plastered, you want it to be about the business, don't. Don't. I don't know who made up the rule that, that you have to push this if it's made up by publicists to be employed more. But, you know, it's like don't do it. And I think people are waiting to hear that they have permission to not do it. Because I think a lot of people feel forced into being out on these platforms when maybe they don't want to be or have an interest to be. I appreciate that a lot because I do not do that stuff and I don't right. like it and I'm not good at it and it's great. And the way I think about it is how you were talking earlier where you were saying like you asked your clients and your clients got you more clients. And that for me is a much better way to acquire customers for me. Totally. It's to, to sort of do that sort of thing rather than try and blast out to the social friends. Um, so what, well, I guess you just answered that question as to what founders, but we get this a lot. I'm not naming them. <laughs> I'm not tattling on anybody. Yeah. Um, but, but I think like a question I get a lot is, especially early on in a company, people say, as a founder of a company, should I elevate myself or should I be in the background and just do the company work? Like, is it uh, valuable for them to be a very public face of the company um, or not. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it depends. I think it depends on what kind of business they have, what product they have. I think what's obviously been popular in the last couple of years is that personal authentic story for a business that if I find a business and I think, oh, these are nice pantyhose, let me buy them. I might buy them. I might not buy them again. But then when I hear Sarah Blakely's story and how she started from nothing and how it was her first patent and her mom helped her file it, and you all of a sudden feel a connection that then when you go to pick between pantyhose, you're like, you know what? I'm going to pick these because that's, you know, I resonate with that, that woman and she was so wonderful. And I think that founder story has a lot of impact and that can be whether you're shopping at Whole Foods or looking at things online that... If there is some sort of foundry type story, you can think, wow, you know, back to the roots. Like, I love what they're doing. I know that I'm going to buy their cereal in Whole Foods instead of somebody else's because I love their mission. And I wouldn't know about that mission unless the founders had gotten out there and really made their faces part of the story. And I think it just depends on the product you have and what you're doing. I think some products call for it and services call for it more than others. You know, I don't think I need to see the founder of Dropbox. I think it's just, I use Dropbox, it's great. I don't know, his face isn't gonna encourage me to use Dropbox more, but if I'm buying cereal in a store, that might drive a lot of affinity. So I think it just depends, but I definitely think it's valuable. For sure, that founder story can be really strong. Cool.
Um, I want to be cognizant of time, so I've got two yeah. final questions for you. Okay. Um, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so the first one is for, uh, it's sort of a broader question, and it's about founders that, it can really be any type of founder. So is there advice that you would give to people who are currently in their job, they're working on something on the side? And yeah. Is there some, some type of advice that you would give them from a, like a business fundamentals perspective? Business fundamentals if you're starting a business. Definitely start with a side hustle. So that's number one, for sure. Two, I would say absorb as much learning as you can. There's tons of great websites, podcasts like this, books. Absorb as much as possible. You are not reinventing the wheel. Someone has done whatever it is you're doing before you. Learn from them. Iterate on what they did. And I think also, again, ask for help as much as possible. The power of asking is huge. Have fun. That's also a thing that people, again, forget in their, you know, pressure to make it successful. They forget to, that it's supposed to be a fun process. Um, and then I think also develop your own personal values and stick with them. I think a lot of times people can get their values wrapped up in the business. And one of the biggest mistakes I see for people who are starting up a company is they think that they are the business. And when people say no to the business, they start to lose their own self-worth. Oh, they didn't like me. Oh, they didn't, uh, they think I'm an idiot. They think I'm trash. They think this. And, and that's, you see a ton of depression in the entrepreneurial community. And I think realizing that you are not your business, people are saying no to your business. They're not saying no to you. You're a separate entity. And I think having that from the start is going to change your life. That is so important. That's like probably one of my favorite, my favorite things you said today. That's awesome. <laughs> um, the last one that I've asked every founder, um, and it's, it's obviously a perspective based question. If you, I was like, all right, I'm super fan now. Yeah. You need to start a taco truck tomorrow. Yeah. How would you approach it? Go to Taco Bell, <laughs> get all the tacos in the truck, and call it Kim's Tacos. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Right? That's good. Yeah. That's I good. mean, it's, but it's, but in all seriousness, I think, I think what I've learned most about my business is so much of it is not reinventing the wheel. And that's a very over-exaggerated example, but I cannot tell you how much in the beginning I thought that I was a pioneer. I was like a Christopher Columbus of, of agencies. And after eight years, I realized everyone's done it before me. There are different iterations, learn from these people, tweak what they've done. But if there's a plan that you saw that someone else do that would work perfectly for your business, do it. Just do it. There's no, there's room for all of us in this entrepreneurial community. And I, I truly believe that a rising tide lifts all ships. And if, if another marketing agency does well, it just means that we're all going to do well. I would love to talk about that. <laughs> Me too. Um, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate it. I've been fun. It's been super fun. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. We're back with a solo episode next week. Have a great fourth.